Recent shortages and purchase limits for some food and paper products is a reminder of how dependent we are on outside supply lines. Alaskans may have worked to grow more of their own food this summer or bought more from local growers. Is that the best solution for ensuring a stable source of groceries and other staples in the future? Beyond grocery store supplies, what does food sovereignty mean? We'll discuss future prospects of access to local food today on Talk of Alaska. Funding for Talk of Alaska was made possible in part by the Alaska Middle Health Trust Authority and listeners just like you. Thank you. And by... Alaska Pipeline Service Company, celebrating more than 42 years of Alaska operations. If you have health insurance through Medicare, the time to make changes to your Part D prescription drug plan is October 15th through December 7th. You can enroll in, change, or drop your prescription plan. Check your plan and compare your options to see if you need to adjust your insurance coverage. If you need help deciding which one is best for you, call Alaska's Medicare Information Office at 800-478-6065 or visit medicare.alaska.gov. This message sponsored by DHSS. The views expressed on this program are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Hello, it's Talk of Alaska. I'm Lori Townsend. Will there be empty spots on store shelves this winter as we experienced in the spring? What does food security mean for Alaskans? There are probably a lot of different answers to that question depending on where you live in the state and whether or not you're someone who tends to lean more on the grocery store and other modern conveniences such as online ordering or if you are someone who shoots, catches, picks, or grows your own food. Here to help us better understand the different approaches to food security are Carolina Behe. Carolina is the Indigenous Knowledge and Science Advisor for the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska. Hi, Carolina. Hi. Thanks so much for being with us today. And also on the line is Amy Pettit. Amy is the Executive Director of the Alaska Farmland Trust. Hello, Amy. Good morning, Lori. Thanks for having me. You can also join our conversation if you're out there listening this morning. Are you someone who gets most of your food from subsistence wild harvesting? Or are you dreaming of growing food for your family and others and want to know how to get started? Did you start a garden, a new garden, or maybe expand one this year? And would like to talk about that experience. Our statewide number is 1-800-478-8255. That's one 800 478 8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. 550-8422. You can email us questions or comments to talk at alaskapublic.org. And we're also streaming to Facebook Live. You can drop comments and questions there as well. So in the sort of in the interest of making sure we're talking about the same thing, or maybe we're talking about vastly different things, we'll we'll discover that today. Would each of you please explain how you define food security and what it means when people are food insecure? Carolina, do you want to start us off? Sure. Well, um, I should say that ICC a couple of years ago facilitated work with Inuit in Alaska where they created their own definition for food security. And that definition is pretty long because it encompasses everything in life. But a key uh, part of it is this first sentence of the definition that um, Inuits uh, hold the natural right, uh, or it is the natural right of all Inuits to be part of the ecosystem, to access food, and to take care, protect, and respect all of life, land, water, and air. But it also talks about the importance of sharing that knowledge and taking care of it for future generations, the importance of um, of the craving, the spiritual and physical cravings for the food, and passing that information on. And it's made up of these six dimensions, being availability, Inuit culture, decision-making power and management, health and wellness, stability and, and accessibility, and characterized by a healthy environment. We, we symbolize that in the shape of a drum, and the handle of the drum is actually food sovereignty. And what we saw through that work is that without food sovereignty, you can't have food security. So it gets at sort of the very essence of what it means to be an Inuit person? 
Um, I don't think I'd be the right person to say that, but I think that it encompasses core parts of um, values um, within the Inuit culture. All right. Thank you for that. And and Amy, how how would you describe food security and what it means to be food insecure for uh, people who are not indigenous to Alaska, but, you know, have a long connection to land and a sense of place and uh, kind of share that common feeling? Yeah, so in my work with the Alaska Food Policy Council over the years, we've worked to define food security in Alaska as well. And today, my understanding of food security is knowing where my next meal is coming from and having the means to obtain it. And and that includes, um, I guess, the personal choice of, does that do I want that next meal to come from the grocery store, from my garden, from the food pantry? Um, but it, it, it encompasses both knowing where it's coming from and having the means to obtain it. All right, thank you. So obviously that, as you noted, can mean a variety of things. Whether the, whether you're able to provide your own food for yourself and um, have success at that, or or if you have to rely on other sources, do you think that food security challenges are the same across Alaska, or are they fundamentally different? Um, for example, does food security in rural Arctic Alaska mean the same thing as it does for residents along the road system? Who wants to take a shot at that? Um, I, I can, if that's okay. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> I think when we look at the food chain, there are overlaps between the two of them, and they have to do with U.S. policy and foreign policy, and, it's, and it becomes very complicated. It's a bit challenging to try to dissect the food chain. So if we think about, like, where is a hot dog coming from, and what are all the subsidies, what are all the different industries involved in making a hot dog? It's actually the corn industry, the oil industry, the beef industry, even transportation industry. All of those industries are subsidized and involved in making a hot dog. And so there, you could see where there could be some overlaps where food is getting shipped into Alaska and where you look at that supply chain or you look at um, that food chain, it's really important to understand those policies and where they're coming from. But then there's other regulations and policies also, and those are directly related to wildlife um, and management within Alaska. And that starts to make a bit of a difference because people are living different lives and different cultural lives and have different values that um, govern the decisions that they make or inform the decisions they make about the environment uh, or the relationship that they have with that environment. So there's other activities that take place. For example, um, there's a large part of physical and mental health that is supported from people being on the land and collecting their own food sources. Um, but people still also buy food from the store. But it's really important that we look at that entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. There's also more complications in shipping to Anchorage versus shipping to rural communities where, you know, due to weather, shipments might not come in. Um, due to changes in sea ice, shipments might not come in. There could be all kinds of reasons why shipments to the stores might not happen. So that increases uh, the need for being able to access local wild sources and practice uh, subsistence harvesting. I, I, I would, I think that, I think that would be yes, but I definitely have heard that from people, but it's also that it's a preference. Um, and so there's multiple needs for that. There's, it's also um, healthier in that way, but there's definitely a need for both. Of course, of course, that makes sense. Uh, Amy, what are your thoughts about that uh, food security in rural places as opposed to for residents along the road system? Yeah, I think there are vast differences. Um, I think that food 
food culture can be so very different in different parts of this state. You know, there are people that um, are accustomed to hunting, gathering, or sharing amongst their community all of the food that they eat throughout the year. Maybe, maybe very little of it actually comes from the grocery store. And, um, and that's a big part of it too, right? That um, I'm not food secure until my entire family, maybe that's people that live outside of my household, are also taken care of and fed as well, right? And that can be very different from someone who maybe lives in the heart of Anchorage and um, their food culture maybe is um, built around which maybe they eat at a different restaurant every day of the week or they'd like a different style or eth ethnic type of food each day of the week. You know, there's just such vast difference across the state in terms of the way that people think about the food that they eat. And my, my friend Arthur Keyes likes to say that nothing has a greater impact on the health of a person than the food that they eat. And we could break that down in a lot of different ways from how important it is to me personally, Amy Pettit. It's important to me that I know who grew my food. I don't grow a lot of my own food, but I purchase food from people that I know. And I feel really good about that, and that's important to me. I've raised my daughters with that um, that's a kind of a standard that we hold ourselves to. We don't, if there's not Alaska grown milk on the grocery store shelves, we don't buy milk that week. We go without. And, and that's just a, you know, something, a standard that we hold ourselves to. Whereas, um, you know, other folks have different parts of their food culture that those food things that are really important to them. And I think, you know, when we talk about the vastness of Alaska, the food culture across this state is really profound. Absolutely. I want to follow up here, um, but before I do, I want to remind folks that this is Talk of Alaska, and we're talking about food security and the different meanings of what that is for people across the state. And also, we're delving into a better understanding of what food sovereignty means for Indigenous people in Alaska. Our numbers statewide, if you'd like to join the conversation on getting your own food or getting it from the store, however you get your supplies. And if you have concerns about that or if you've changed the way that you're approaching making sure that you're properly stocked up, especially as we head into winter, give us a call at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. 550-8422. You can also email questions or comments to talk at alaskapublic.org or drop them onto Alaska Public Media's Facebook page as we're streaming live there as well. Amy, the Farmland Trust site notes that only 5% of our food is grown in the state. That's really pretty bleak. But there's also good news. The number of Alaska farms has grown 30% in the last five years and small one to nine acre farms are up by 73%. Talk a little bit about this growth and especially about the very small operations. Are these hobby growers operating on five acres or less or can people actually make a living with small amounts of acreage? You bet. You know, those statistics are so exciting to those of us involved in Alaska agriculture. Um, during the, the last census of agriculture when those numbers came out we were so excited to lead the nation in so many of the categories growth in number of farms number of female farmers we're very high in the nation in veteran farmers and we're we're really proud of that and a lot of a lot of folks have said why why is that happening in alaska and i don't have the answer i think i think everybody should um you know think about that a little bit and and question themselves and, and ask that why did that happen here but Alaskans, and, and I always have to caveat that by saying I've only been here 15 years. I don't call myself an Alaskan yet. I know that's not allowed. But Alaskans <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> After 15 years. Right. I'm not there yet, right? Um, and I always say 15 winters, right? I've survived 15 winters. But anyway, Alaskans are so proud of um, many things about living here and being from here, et cetera. But I, I find they're particularly proud of their food and whether that is what they've subsistence harvested or wild harvested or what they can grow themselves. You know, we have all these giant vegetables, world record giant vegetables and things like this. Um, but uh, so the growth in number of farms, I I'm not sure what all has led to that. There have been a number of USDA, United States Department of Agriculture programs encouraging high tunnel use 
and grant programs for farmers to get started, et cetera. But I think just part of the national trend of knowing where your food comes from, perhaps more Alaskans have become aware of the fact that there aren't that many farmers in this state and, and they want to start growing more of their own. And to, to answer your question about those small, less than 10 acre farms and whether you or not you can make a living, you absolutely can. I know some of the most successful farmers here in the Palmer area are on less than 10 acres. One of them is on less than seven acres, and they are for sure making their living, paying all their bills, paying employees, et cetera, off of you know less than 10 acres. So there really is opportunity there. Wow, that's, uh, that really is interesting, and I want to talk a little more about that. When you look at the supply lines heading into Alaska and the ones that are moving within the state, what do you see as major threats or risk factors that could disrupt them? Well, the pandemic did disrupt them. Right. Um, you know, people people may have noticed, you know, the, the toilet paper shortage and some of the other things. But if, if you went to one of the major retail grocery stores in April, you did not find Idaho potatoes. Idaho stopped shipping potatoes to the state of Alaska um, during the pandemic. And the grocery stores were a little bit panicky about what to do. But thankfully, our Alaskan farmers have incredible um, storage facilities and they're used to holding potatoes all winter long and giving the grocery stores you know a few um, pallets at a time per week as much as they need etc but when the grocery stores stop receiving potatoes from outside suddenly they turned to the farmers and they said more more you know we need so much more and for whatever reason people were also it seemed to be stocking up on potatoes which is great it's not a bad thing at all But our farmers sold more potatoes in those couple of months than they had ever in the history of growing and and selling in the state. They've never moved as much product as they did during the initial stages of the pandemic. Hmm. Fascinating information. And I I want to drill down a bit in in some of those areas. But first, Carolina, the the, uh, project that's called Food Sovereignty and Self-Governance, Inuit Role in Managing Arctic Marine Resources, it, it's centered on four case studies, walrus and salmon in Alaska and char and beluga in Canada. Tell us about these case studies, why you focused on those areas and um, what the effort is, what you're uh, trying to achieve through studying these particular food sources. Mm-hmm. Well, when we finished up the food security report, it had many um, recommendations. And one of the points that came out of it is, as I said, there's those six dimensions that are needed to support a healthy environment. And one of them is decision-making power and management. And um, that report was co-authored by uh, over 140 Indigenous knowledge holders, um, Inuit. And they had put forward that one of the largest problems here in Alaska was the lack of decision-making power and management directly affecting the food sovereignty. So one of the recommendations that they put out was to look at um, what type of management structures were being employed in other Inuit regions. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, Inuit are in Chukotka, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. The New Galway Settlement region in Canada is the Inuit region closest to us here in Alaska. And so when we started talking to our partners there, the New Galway Green Council and Fisheries Joint Management Committee, um, they they are the ones that chose what species would be good to have a look at. Um, And then over here, too, in Alaska, when we talked to some of the contributing authors, they suggested also looking at salmon and walrus. And the idea was to kind of look at species that were a bit similar between the two places. But the truth is, is that Inuit don't do single species management. And Inuit management practices have been around for thousands of years, so they're not new. But these, were, these case studies were just meant to be a window into a larger discussion. And so we worked with a lawyer that did a legal analysis of looking at what's on the books. But just because something's on the books doesn't mean that it's actually what's being employed or what should be on the books. So the really important part about this work is putting Inuit practices, perspectives, knowledge, and approaches at the forefront of the discussions about co-management, about decision-making, and looking, really looking at what supports or impedes food sovereignty at both a national and international scale. 
One of the findings in the ICC's conceptual framework is that without food sovereignty, food security cannot exist. You were just talking about looking at, you know, management laws and things that are on the books. So t tell us a little bit about how those things intersect when you're talking about food sovereignty um, leading to food security. What does that mean? And um, describe how you uh, vision what food security or what food sovereignty really is. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the definition that was used to guide the work in both the food security work and the food sovereignty and self-governance work, it states that the, that food sovereignty is the right of Alaskan Inuit, of all Inuit, to define their own hunting, gathering, fishing, land, and water policies, the right to define what is sustainable, socially, economically, and culturally appropriate for the distribution of food and to maintain ecological health, the right to obtain and maintain practices that ensure access to tools needed to obtain, process, and uh, store and consume traditional foods. So if we, think, if we think about that definition, it's really the right to fake control. Right? It's really about the right, uh, I've heard some colleagues say, the right to be left alone, <laughs> to mm. practice what has been practiced for many, many years. But, of course, many uh, Inuit want co-management. But when, when that's being said, it's looking for true co-management, not, not to be told what should be done or to have to negotiate down, but to come to an equitable table where, they, where there's space for them to bring forward their knowledge, their practices, their approaches. There's really huge differences in a lot of the examples that the authors in this report put forward. But one of the largest ones has to do with the way that the environment is looked at in just given um, whether policies reflect the thought of people being part of the ecosystem or reflect people believing they're separate from the ecosystem. And a lot of times those regulations and policies are interpreted as trying to control um, the animals or the weather. And that, that's, not a, that's not the approach used within... Uh, the Inuit Indigenous practices. Thank you for that. And Amy, I want to get you in here now uh, to talk a little bit about the other, sort of the other end of the spectrum when we talk about food security, food sovereignty. But there's a lot of intersections there about, about how f you're managing the whole environment. You're not just managing, you know, one particular field. And so talk a little bit about about how that works and, and how that's um, part of the, of the composition of how farmers view their land that they're stewards of. And, and then let's talk a little bit about why the state, why isn't the state growing more food? There's a lot of arable land, but relatively few farms and ag, agriculture operations. So talk about how what you just heard Carolina say is um, a lot of those same mindsets and ideas about how people work with the the land and, and grow things uh, that there's an intersection there yeah absolutely I was I was listening to Carolina and I was thinking about how sometimes farmers um, across the country and, and here in Alaska get uh, a bad reputation for being bad actors on the land um, for polluting the land and water or not taking care of things appropriately. Um, we hear in other countries about clear cutting taking place to make way for more agricultural practices. Um, but I would say for the farmers that I know and for the majority of farmers in Alaska, uh, if they don't take care of the land that they're growing food on, they're not successful. If they don't use the best practices and, you know, the, the best management practices and environmental practices, the, the ground won't perform for them uh, repeatably. When we talk about sustainability, um, we're not talking about one year or one growing season. A farmer has to implement practices that will help him to be successful for the long haul. And, um, you know, listening to the land, responding to how the, the land responds to them, utilizing um, the farm, uh, the agencies that are around Alaska to um, help folks implement better practices, whether that's USDA or the Soil and Water Conservation Districts 
or folks at the Division of Agriculture, um, I think most of our farmers really try to do the best that they can and are also constantly trying to learn better practices and better methodologies for working the land because it's it's not a short-term gain. Farmers are, I don't know any farmers that are in it for one season. You're always looking towards the next season and, and what could I implement this year that's going to help me five years from now? How can I improve my practices? Um, you, you can't, you can't abuse the ground that you're on because it is limited and um, and it won't perform the following year. And to the second part of your question about um, why don't we have more producers or, you know, what are some of the um, barriers to access to the agriculture industry? I think there are some myths around that. Um, most often when we poll people about why, um, what are some of the barriers to getting into Alaska agriculture, we hear two things. We hear access to land and we hear access to capital. And I'd like to point out to folks that um, there is uh, there is land available. There is there is land right now that is looking for farmers, so to speak. We have a program at Alaska Farmland Trust called Farm Link, and it is a kind of a dating site for land seekers and <laughs> land owners. That's awesome. <laughs> and, I would encourage folks, if they're looking for land, um, to visit our website, akfarmland.com, and click on the Farm Link button and um, take a look at the, uh, the properties that are available right now. We've successfully made three matches through our Farm Link program, and we're, we're excited about that. The other um, myth is access to capital. And folks, you know, oftentimes if you want to purchase land or get into Alaska agriculture, you need some borrowing power. And thankfully, we've got three great agriculture-specific lenders in the state of Alaska that are ready, willing, and able to talk to folks about how to get their farm started. That's the USDA Farm Services Agency, the Division of Agriculture, Agriculture Revolving Loan Fund, and the Alaska Rural Rehabilitation Corporation, ARRC. All three of those organizations are looking for additional agriculture loans and looking for folks that want to expand their ag operations. Is Farm Link, Farm Link unique to Alaska, or is are there similar programs in other places? Yeah, it's not unique. Um, before I came to Farmland Trust, I've been here five years, and before I came, the previous manager had heard this issue across the state that farmers couldn't find land. But we also knew that there were landowners that were no longer farming their property. And so she did some research across other states, and we spent we actually spent a lot of time on that homework piece trying to find some of the best programs in other states that were most successful at connecting land seekers with landowners. I believe we formed our program most closely to the California and Maine farm link programs. And so yeah, this is happening across the country where people are both retiring out of agriculture but want to get someone else on their land and people that are trying to get back to the land and expand their agriculture um, base. So yeah, we, we built it off of um, the hard work of other folks. All right. Well, thanks for that. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation about food security and food sovereignty, uh, both from an indigenous perspective and from a farming perspective as Talk of Alaska continues statewide. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. Whether your child is in school online or you are a first time homeschooled teacher, live homework help supports you with on-demand tutoring, test preparation, and writing assistance for students in grades K through 12 and the first year of college. Live Homework Help is a free service made available through the Alaska Library Network. Log in from anywhere to SLED, that's S-L-E-D dot Alaska dot E-D-U. This message is sponsored by the Alaska Library Network.
Welcome back to Talk of Alaska. We're talking about food security and um, food sovereignty and what that means today. And on the line is Carolina Behe, who is the Indigenous Knowledge and Science Advisor for the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska, and Amy Pettit, who is the Executive Director of the Alaska Farmland Trust. You can join our conversation statewide at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. If you are in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org. We're going to get to some of those emails here in a minute. But, uh, Carolina, I wanted to ask about um, some of the the information within the report, you had a lot of focus groups, and one of the focus group's participants had this to say about being checked by a game management official. The quote was, I've never been a criminal, but that's the way I feel when these people come. I didn't do anything wrong, and yet they're there with their guns, and they're going through my stuff. There was discussion in the report about this as an area of disrespect for people who had managed resources for thousands of years. Does it does it seem like a lot of this is sort of like a cultural disconnect between Inuit people and game managers, sort of a misunderstanding of how to manage to achieve the same results, which is sustainable harvest? Yeah, that's really what people talked about in this report. Um, and a lot of those relationships are improving, but there's still this feeling left from when it's happened in the past. Um, and there's still this feeling that can happen at meetings also for some people um, or for some groups. I have to say a lot of it depends, what was described is that a lot of it depends on who the representatives, individual representatives are and not necessarily the entire agency. And so feelings, um, people really described feeling like they were being disrespected and a lack of trust and respect for their knowledge and that they've been there for thousands of years by even people's body language of, of um, representatives rolling their eyes or, or only being given three minutes to have a, give a testimony as opposed to actually having discussions and putting their information forward. But the power dynamic um, that exists there that's rooted from our policies and, and, act, and activities that were you know, uh, developed from a dominant culture to address that dominant culture's needs still prevails and and leaves you know leaves it being left known of who actually has the power within that room. So even if even if somebody describes something like that that happened ten years ago or fifteen years ago, it still leaves that feeling mm-hmm. inside themselves and when they're in that room and even things that are less aggressive, such as eye rolling but still aggressive, it just keep that going there. How problematic is it for people to have policies and laws or meetings to gather information on proposed changes be in English? How does that affect deliberations and and, uh, the flow of conversation? Yeah, people describe the the connection between food sovereignty and language in numerous ways and in multiple ways. Um, You know, as as one author put it, um, he simply says, um, we're expected to know their laws, their language, their science, but then they come here and know nothing about us, nothing about our culture, nothing about the way we have discussions. So even thinking about that language from actual Inuit dialects to even the type of body language um, and the way that you communicate with each other and show respect for each other is something that comes up. What, for, for those that do speak their Inuit dialects, um, one example uh, that came up quite frequently was the different words that are used and the complex concepts that people are trying to translate into English. And so one, uh, for example, uh, many different communities and dialects will have multiple words for an animal. And one example was given was from a community uh, that has five words for beluga. And each one of those words describes something. Uh, it, it might describe the age of the beluga or the relationship between that beluga and type of ice or even the relationship you're meant to have with that beluga. But when you sit at a management table and you're expected just to say beluga, it all of a sudden drops off all of these important parts 
that uh, are needed to make a decision, a holistic decision. Hmm. So a big disconnect there when language is, is a barrier. Uh, I want to go to the phones in just a moment, but first an email. This is from Kay, and Kay writes, I appreciate and respect the Alaska Native way of being. There are many other non-Natives that hold in high importance connectedness with the land, a good earth steward, and the importance of eating all natural foods. We are not Native, but we hunt and grow food for our family. My grandparents instilled this in us, the importance of knowing how to harvest, field dress, and prepare for the table all types of wild game. In an emergency, at least we have those skills. I appreciate schools that teach children this vital skill, native or non-native, it's a vital survival skill. So I think that kind of gets at the heart of what a lot of people see in that respect, regardless of of your ethnic background, how you were raised. Uh, it, it comes down to that connection with land and, and respecting uh, the resources that it provides. Let's go to the phones for a moment. Harry is in Anchorage. Hi, Harry. Good morning. Good morning. So I, I wanted to talk about uh, community, I mean, expanding community gardens and, and community greenhouses. Um, you know, I've, I've been to Europe, uh, to Switzerland and Germany, where they, they have large community uh, garden uh, areas, and they, they use um, excess public land that's not being used. And they rent out small plots, and people can go and grow their own uh, vegetables and, and food. And, um, you know, we could, well, there's a perfect place uh, next, next door to the Totem Theater. There's 22 and a half acres of, of school district and park land that's not being used for anything but a, a homeless camp now. Um, and um, that 22 and a half acres could grow a lot of, of uh, food for, for people especially people that are immigrants that have um, a big connection to the, the land and know how to, to grow vegetables and gardens. Um, I think that's something that we could put the municipality, the school district, um, and um, uh, Chugach Electric together and, and put some community greenhouses where we could um, have a better food security here and mm -hmm. grow our own. All right, great uh, suggestions, and, and that kind of leads into uh, a question for the urban setting to Amy. Is Do you think that full food security is possible in urban areas uh, such as South Central Alaska, given the population pressure on local resources like salmon and moose and caribou, um, you know, uh, against the backdrop of what Harry was suggesting of using more pocket areas for greenhouses and, and gardens. Um, do you think it's possible that even in an urban setting, we could get to that point where we're more food stable and food secure than uh, only 5% of our food being grown here? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate Harry's um, comments. And, and I would say he's just the kind of champion that we need to bring forward that sort of mission. I have a sticky note on my on my cork board here. It says, no champion, no mission, right? You need people like Harry that are willing to think creatively and come to the table, point out the vacant land, point out the resources that could be brought to the table, and then take action. And there's examples of that happening in Anchorage. The Grow North Farm, I'm not sure, Lori, if you're familiar with them. Yes. Or if you've had them on the show before. Yeah. They're doing great work with the with the population, the surrounding population, um, with youth development, and there, there's just fantastic things happening. And you know, I was raised I was raised by a farmer, a rancher. Um, I would be fifth generation on my family's land down in Oregon if I were there, and that bred into me eternal optimism. So, do I think that we could become food secure in the in the urban parts of Alaska? Absolutely. I think we could do anything we put our mind to. And if, if you know, it's been proven that you can eat all Alaskan. You know, um, I can't remember. It's been a couple of years ago, but. Um, Saskia, she ate all, only Alaskan food for an entire year and, and tracked it in the Anchorage Daily News. Um, I think it was the only thing that she ate that wasn't produced in Alaska was coffee, right? Like, but you, there, <laughs> there's creative ways to even have coffee now, right? Um, anyway, I, I absolutely think it's possible. I think the right people have to come to the table. There has to be a champion. We have to listen to all those concerns. 
um, who, you know, everybody who has an idea has to be listened to respectfully and, and see if we can't incorporate their perspective. But I, I really do think it's possible, and people are proving that it's possible all across the state. All right, let's talk a little bit more about rural food security. Um, we have a question from George in Anchorage wondering about what the collapse of the Yukon River salmon fishery means for su- food security. And are the declines in salmon returns over the last several years tied to climate change? So, uh, Carolina, how, what have you heard from people about the concerns over fisheries where we're seeing low returns, some of the runs were quite bad, we're seeing restrictions on some game harvests? Uh, Is that a big part of this project and the considerations that ICC is undertaking right now to look at all these things together? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I would say it would be really important to talk to the people on the Yukon about about that question directly. Uh, For this project, it was the Cuscom River Intertribal Fishery Commission that's a partner. And so it was primarily people on the Cuscom River that were um, authors of this report. But I can say for um, salmon fisheries in general, there is a concern of the uh, low numbers. There's a concern of the bycatch out in the Bering Sea and the impact that it is having, potentially having, on the size of salmon. There is concerns about temperatures. And I'm sure everybody remembers when there was extremely high surface temperatures and and there was some fish found belly up in different rivers in Alaska. Um, So those those definitely are concerns. Um, And it's also important to remember that this relationship that people have with fish um, and it it makes it even more important to be ensuring that those knowledge holders are having an equitable seat at the table. So some of the issues that we've heard come up quite a bit about that is is feeling like the indigenous knowledge is not treated with trust and respect at those decision-making tables when in fact that indigenous knowledge has proven to identify multiple more indicators um, and an understanding of indicators of those salmon more so than, than the science has. Of course, that's not meant to say a competition between the science and the indigenous knowledge. Both are needed, but just both are being given equitable space. There's also this really important part, the, the last part that I'll, that I'll emphasize here, is that part of food security and food sovereignty is implementing in, Inuit practices that are really rooted in a holistic understanding of the relationship between multiple components in the environment. And that allows you to see cumulative impacts and to make adaptive, um, holistic decisions. But regulations oftentimes are taking a different approach. And so sometimes those regulations could, can conflict with the indigenous knowledge. For example, it, it might say, go fish on May 10th, when, it, when the indigenous knowledge might be saying, you shouldn't fish on May 10th. You need to wait till it stops raining so that you don't waste any fish, mm-hmm. uh, for example. Mm-hmm. People that contributed to the findings in in your report said that politics is one of the greatest threats impacting food security and food sovereignty. Um, You know, you were just talking about rigid game management um, dates that uh, are set in law. Um, Give us some other examples to uh, the types of threats that are sort of political in nature and how that affects food security and sovereignty. Yeah, I think that if we go to the international audience or, or the international forums, that's where there's a really, really good example. Or even nationally, what people were really talking about um, is in part related to this lobbying power. And so oftentimes things become political when they become this kind of black and white thinking, all or nothing kind of thinking. Um, and, and and then again, that's, that's not really the approach taken within Inuit life. Um, For example, people do rely on development and do take care of the environment. It's both. It's not just one or the other um, all the time. But there's really heavy lobbying from from groups from one side to another. So one example is with the ivory ban that Mm -hmm. started to happen a few years ago, where all of a sudden some states started lumping in walrus ivory into that when 
that when really those people lobbying should have been looking to Inuit sustainable practice of harvesting uh, walrus ivory as an ex- as a as an extreme uh, pristine example of how to have sustainable practices, but instead it became a threat, and and that was largely due to politics and people lobbying with these kind of one sided looks at things. I guess and a, a misunderstanding of what was really happening in Arctic communities that were practicing sustainable harvest as opposed to elephant ivory and um, unsustainable poaching that was happening in that setting. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's an example of, um, you know, if you if you look for people in rural communities, they don't often have the time or the money to go lobbying in in government uh, cities, you know, right. and people are really busy collecting food and living life, <laughs> and mm. and, um, and and that creates that's part of that unequal balance and power dynamics that is embedded within our systems right now. And so that's what people were kind of talking about when they talked about that po- those politics being a threat. We have to take another quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation on food security and food sovereignty as Talk of Alaska continues statewide. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. If you are at home with someone who makes you feel unsafe, help is available. The Strong Hearts Native Helpline is here for you if you are experiencing domestic violence. You are not alone. Call 1-844-762-8483 or visit strongheartshelpline.org. This message brought to you by the Council on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Welcome back to Talk of Alaska. Let's go back to the phones for a moment. Judy is in Gustavus. Hi, Judy. Oh, Judy is in Gustavus, but no longer on the phone line. All right, uh, Amy, I have a question for you. Uh, you were talking about myths as it's associated with farming and access to farming. Um, how much farmland is being developed for other purposes, such as subdivisions for homes or businesses? How how much of a threat is that uh, currently? Well, that's exactly why Alaska Farmland Trust exists, because back in 2005, local leaders saw the rapid development of agricultural lands here and particularly in the Matanuska Susitna Valley. And they said, we have got to do something about this. Why are so many farmers selling out to mostly to housing developments? And so they created Alaska Farmland Trust to have an alternative solution because one of the things that happens is when a, when a farmer does get to retirement age, all of their assets are tied up in their land. They often haven't been paying into a retirement account or setting aside money, and all of their value, all of their asset is tied up in that land. And so when it comes time to retire, if there isn't a family member that's ready to take over the farm, or sometimes even if there is, the only way to transition that um, value out of the land is to sell it, and the highest bidder is often someone who wants to develop the property. Our agricultural lands are flat, they're cleared, they're well-draining soils, they're perfect for housing developments, right? But unfortunately, the, the land that is most ready to produce food is is also that, that farmland, right? And so We've seen rapid development. We're working right now on a mapping project to try and get to some specific numbers about how much ag land has been lost here in the Matsu Valley just in the last 20 years, but it's undeniable. Anyone who's lived in the valley or traveled back and forth over the last couple of decades has noticed the rapid decline in the amount of farmland, and it's a real problem, and again, it's exactly why we exist. Mm -hmm. All right, Uh, Carolina, Carolina, I, I want to talk a little bit about climate change and how that's affecting the way that people go about uh, traditional hunting and gathering and, and those practices. How has warming affected harvests and storage specifically? Are people figuring out, I'm sure they are, new ways to store food if they're seeing more rain uh, and, you know, that's affecting how they're doing drying or smoking or or if, uh, you know, in areas where we see stable permafrost that was once stable is now melting and thawing and compromising ice cellars, it seems like as these things change, it's going to add expense to how people uh, prepare and store their food. Um, 
Is that part of the broader discussions in this larger project that you're taking on? Well, within this project, people did talk a lot about the changes that they're seeing, um, but they were in relation to, again, that decision-making power part of it and food sovereignty part of it. Um, so what we hear continuously is that people uh, in it will adapt. They have adapted for thousands of years, but that becomes uh, really difficult if policy and regulations don't support um, their knowledge uh, and decision-making power to to for that to happen. And one of those examples has to do with that quick adaptive decision-making that looks at the environment very holistically. Uh, so, for example, if a new type of whale is coming by your community, it's important to harvest that whale. Um, if, uh, if the salmon are running and it's raining and it's going to mold the fish before drying, it's important that you wait to dry it. So I think that that's an important part of it. But it's also really important for there to be financial support for these changes as well and to also think about the infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure that already exists within communities. So people have talked about needing to travel further away, which means more, more fuel. It means a larger cost. More fuel is needed. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that intersect, but the, the part that this report focuses on is that importance of recognizing um, the expertise and authority that Inuit has held for thousands of years and that those practices are still in place today, that they've built upon and adapted and are in place today, but they need to, they need to be supported within policy and regulations to make those decisions um, so that they can adapt. And I, I want to go to the phones in just a second here, but um, talk about some of what those recommendations are. How, how, what has ICC laid out for policymakers and state leaders? Are there recommendations coming forward from this work that you're undertaking, this multi-year project? Yeah, there's multiple calls to action, multiple ones, and they're all grouped under eight themes. And these themes, um, you know, when you go through the report, you will see that some of those calls to actions are specific to Alaska, some are specific to the New Gout Settlement Region, and some are for across the circumpolar Arctic, across Inuit, Nunat. And that's because not every community is the same. However, there was the, there was a connection um, throughout these themes. We, we refer to these as transformative recommendations, but the truth is, is that is that those, those that have worked are from Indigenous communities or worked with Indigenous communities, many of these recommendations have been called for for many years. Um, the transformative part would be if they're actually implemented. And so when we hear uh, international forums or international forums um, calling for transformative change and the need for a paradigm shift and the need to adjust, so this whole time, Inuit have been giving a lot of guidance of how that could happen. And so a lot of these recommendations address that uh, specifically. Mm. But it requires people to actually look at what role can they individually play. So if you're working in an agency, what role can your agency play? But what role can you individually play? If you're even just a citizen or a researcher, or any role that you play, what could you be doing to advance these recommendations? Let's go to the phones for a moment. Beth, Mary is in Bethel. Hi, Mary. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Carolina. Um, this is Mary Peltola from Bethel. I work for the Fish Commission that Carolina is talking about. And I'm the, the work is fascinating, and I've learned a lot. One of the things that I've learned is that Western science really doesn't have indicators or um, indexes to show where a run is, um, like if 5% has gone by or 50 or 90% of the run has gone by. And um, the last six years, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Refuge has partnered with the Intertribal Fish Commission. We have three in-season managers from different sections of the river who share their traditional knowledge and where they think the run is because there are indicators in traditional knowledge for um, – many, many different things. Um, one of them is also um, forecasting, and one of our in-season managers uses the migratory birds coming back as 
um, his forecast for abundance. Um, mm-hmm. And I was just wondering, my question is, do you think there are other species that this could be, um, you know, utilized with uh, traditional knowledge like halibut or shrimp or, or caribou or deer? Carolina, do you have ideas about that? Have, have mm-hmm. you heard about those kinds of uh, yeah, movement in I that direction? Say, mm-hmm. And I have to say, Koyana and Mary, for calling in, Mary is actually on the advisory committee for this Food Sovereignty and Self-Governance Report and one of the contributing authors. It's a very, very important question, and, and I would say yes. We, we hear about it throughout Indigenous knowledge. It's all about those relationships between those different pieces, so the relationship between the fish and the vegetation on the riverbank, the relationship between the whale and the krill, the relationship between the whale and the ice, the relationship between walrus and benthic species, all of these things that are, are important relationships that are continuously highlighted in Indigenous knowledge. And so I think science also often calls them indicators or, or, or other terms, um, but it really seems to come down to those relationships. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that, and thanks for the, the comment and question, Mary. Uh, Amy, I want to get back to you in our final minute here. T- tell us a little bit about how crops have changed in the, in the last few decades and, and what's sort of on the horizon for uh, new crops that may be uh, farmers may be able to grow now in Alaska that they couldn't in the past. Well, we are definitely noticing the change in the farming community. Um, we, we hear reports about farmers um, gaining 10 days on either side of the growing season, which is significant when you only have a 100-day growing season typically to gain 10% on the front and back end of the growing season can really change things significantly, whether that's, you know, there are some grains that take a certain number of days to um, to uh to be ready to harvest. Um, I'm hearing, I I heard about cantaloupes being grown in Alaska this year, which blew my mind. Apparently there's a farmer that's been growing cantaloupes in high tunnels for years. We've got um, hops that, you know, we've got such a thriving beer industry and brewing industry here in Alaska, but all of the hops have to be imported from the lower 48. But we've got some growers now that are getting hops to, um, to fully mature and, and be ready to be harvested here in Alaska. So, Things are changing, and I know that our um, our highly optimistic and intuitive farmers will continue to adapt and find new new products to grow. And it's exciting times. All right. Well, thank you so much to Carolina Carolina Behe, who is the Indigenous Knowledge and Science Advisor for the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska, and Amy Pettit, who is the Executive Director of the Alaska Farmland Trust. Thanks to our engineer Eric Bork. Our producers, Zachariah Hughes, on the phones and social media, Abby Collins. Next week on Talk of Alaska, we'll uh, have a conversation about animals and not the political kind. So a little break there. On Friday night at 8 o'clock on Alaska Public Media Television, join us for Alaska Insight. Alaska Native women face some of the highest rates of violence of any group in the country. Family members and activists have drawn more attention to the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women, and now elected officials say they're working to address it. But what else is needed? That's Friday night at 8 p.m. on Alaska Public Media Television. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Lori Townsend. We'll be back next week. Talk of Alaska is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Views expressed are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Today's program is available online at alaskapublic.org. This is Alaska Public Media. Alaska Public Media.